Man, what a, what a beautiful Sunday. And when I mean beautiful, I don't mean like outside because outside it's pretty smoky. And like I went to my wife and I, we decided, you know what we wanted to do? My, my family, most of my family lives in Calgary. So what we decided to do is meet at Sylvan Lake yesterday. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Sylvan Lake on a Saturday. If you have, has anyone been to Sylvan Lake on a Saturday in the middle of summer? Last time I went to Sylvan Lake, uh, before this, I went in February, okay? There was not a soul. I don't think that person lives in Sylvan Lake unless it's the summer. So we go yesterday. Uh, there was millions of people there, millions. Like probably three million people were at the beach. Like, like, like I'm telling you, you could not find a place to like sit. You could barely find a place to like get into the water. It was absolutely unbelievable. But it's because I think as Albertans, we realize the value of warm weather. We realize that it doesn't matter if it's smoky. It doesn't matter if it's 12 degrees. We're going to the beach, right? Like, we're going to find a beach. The seven that we have access to here close to us, we're going to find the beach. We're going to go to the beach, find some warm weather. But, you know, I was able to go see my family. It was amazing. And, and we were able to kind of, just, yeah, just celebrate family. But today, we're going to be we're continuing a series we've been walking through. And if you've been with us, you know, we've gone through this series called I Am. And the series has really just been the I am statements that Jesus makes in the book of John. And, and you know, when, it, when we look at identity, when we look at that I am statement, it's so interesting because if somebody asks me who I am, there's a lot of things that I am, right? I'm not just one thing. Someone might be like, who are you? What, 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 who, like, what do you do? And I'd be like, well, there's a lot of things. One thing, I'm a, I'm a husband, right? That's part of my identity. The other thing, I'm a father. I'm a son. I'm a cousin. I'm a brother. I have a lot of things. I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian, right? Like we all have a lot of things about us that depending on the circumstance, depending on who we're meeting, depending on who we're talking to, we can, we almost are something different to them depending on relationship, right? Because to Beth, I'm her husband, but to somebody else, I'm their brother, or I'm their father, whatever that might be. And these are such beautiful statements that Jesus makes. And Jesus is saying, here is who I am. This is my character. This is how much I love you. This is what I have done for you. This is what I'm going to do for you. And it's such an amazing thing when we look at these I am statements he makes. Because when people tell you who they are, as long as they're telling the truth, <laughs> that's when we learn a lot about somebody. We even learn a lot about somebody when they're not telling the truth, right? Y'all met somebody who just tells you, maybe you're a, like, a, like, a, like a boss, and somebody applies for a job with you, and on their resume, you're like, this is too good to be true. And then they start working for you, you're like, they don't know any of this stuff. Have you ever had that happen? Right? Where like somebody's just not what they said they were. But Jesus, what I love about it, is when he says who he is, he's telling the truth. He's saying, this is who I am. This is what I came to do for you and in you. This is who I am. And it's such a beautiful uh, reminder to us of who he is. Because each aspect of who Jesus is affects us all in different ways. Right? For some of us, we, 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 as we've gone through, we've learned that, you know, Jesus is the good shepherd. For some of us, that's exactly what we need right now. We need somebody to guide us. We need somebody to clean us. We need somebody to take care of us. For some of us, we've been walking in the darkness for so long. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, that's what we need. Right now in this moment, all of us are walking through different seasons in life. We're all going through things that are different. We're all facing different challenges, different circumstances, different levels. And, and this is so beautiful because I believe that each one of these affects us in a different way. And this next one uh, comes from John chapter 15 verse 2. This is what it says. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch, branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. He says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And if we go to verse 5 here, John 15, verse 5, it's, he says it again. It says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Right? There's two characters. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I look at this. Now, I am not a plant person, okay? Like, I was talking to somebody this morning. Me and outside don't really mesh very well because I am allergic to outside. Like, like, like if we're driving our car and somebody's mowing the lawn, I have to roll up my window because I will just have an allergic reaction and you don't want that when you're driving, right? 
You don't want watery eyes. You don't want somebody sneezing. My mom, it's a true story. My mom sneezes nine times every single time. So imagine driving with her, right? Like when you sneeze, it's pretty hard to keep your eyes open. And so she sneezes nine times as we're driving. I remember as a kid, I'd be praying in the back seat, right? Like, save us. <laughs> like, I don't want to die, you know? Like, like, true story. But like, like, I'm allergic to the outside. I don't know a lot about plants. I, I don't know a lot about grapes. I, I don't know a lot about vines or vine dressers. Like, what do vine dressers do? Do they dress the vines? Like, I don't, like, what is this stuff, right? I'm not, I don't know a lot about plants, okay? Maybe you're a plant person and you can teach me. Like, some of y'all have gardens. I don't. Okay, like I don't have that because I don't know how it works. You give me a plant. So one time somebody gave me a Venus flytrap. Died in three days. Like I didn't even know they could die that fast and they did. did. Like it just like was almost a miracle. Um, so I just don't know a lot about plants. And, and in, in this verse is, right, we see three characters or three people that, that Jesus is talking about in here. And there's three things. And so I'm just going to go through it, really basic level. I'm literally going to define what these things are to help me more than to help you, okay? So this is it. What is a vine, right? A vine is described as this, a climbing or trailing woody stemmed plant of the grape family. Right? That's a vine. We've seen vines before. And, and so Jesus, what he's saying here, he says, okay, I am the vine. What I am is I am the system of growth for fruit. Okay? I am what provides nutrients to the fruit, to the branches, right? To, to actually produce the food. The system of nutrients, the system of branches in order to help make sure that, that they bear fruit. That's what I am. You want grapes, you need a vine. Right, so if you want grape juice, you need a vine. And so Jesus is saying, I am the vine. You want a tomato, you need a vine, okay? That's what vines do. And so Jesus here, he's saying, I am the true vine. And when we are attached to him, we get what we need. And what, but some of us were attached to the wrong vine. See, Jesus here says, I am the true vine. Right? He's not saying, I am the vine. He's saying, I am the true vine. I think some of us, were getting our nutrients from the wrong place. So what we bring inside of us, what we listen to, what we, what we read, that actually comes inside and that's what we produce. And so Jesus is saying, if you're not, if you're not attached to me, you're going to be producing the wrong thing or you're not actually going to be productive. You're not actually going to be making anything. He's saying, I am the true vine because what you are attached to matters. What you put inside of you matters. What you feed yourself matters. What you read, what you listen to, what you pay attention to matters. So this is the first character. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Number two is we hear him call the father the vine dresser. Okay, so he says, I'm the vine dresser. Now, a vine dresser is this. A person who prunes, who trains, and cultivates vines. That's what a vine dresser is. Somebody who prunes, trains, and cultivates vines vines and he's saying that the he's saying the father is the one who takes care of the vines takes care of the branches he's saying the father is the one who prunes takes things away to make sure that the that these plants that these vines can actually be producing fruit he's the one who prunes he teaches and cultivates the growth of fruit out to the vine dressers number three is this the, the the last character is uh we hear him say is he calls us the branches right we he says i am the true vine the Father is the vine dresser, and you are the branches. That's who you are. That's who I am saying to you. And a branch is a part of a tree that grows out from the trunk or from a bow. A, a branch grows from the vine, and that's the thing that holds the fruit. So, so Jesus is the vine. We're attached to the vine. We're a branch, and we produce the fruit. That's what he is saying in this. And those are the three characters in the story. And we can read this again. John 15, verse 1 says this, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may be able to bear more fruit. Now, when we look at this word, right, it says takes away. I think I have it bolded. It says takes away. He, he takes away. Now, there's two thoughts on what exactly this means. There's a lot of scholars that have dove into this. What does he takes away mean? And so the first thought is that it means that, that if we're not bearing any fruit, the vine dresser being the father, he will take us away. Right? He will actually, other uh, uh, versions say he actually cuts them off. 
Like he cuts them off and takes them away. That when God looks at us and he says, okay, they're not bearing fruit, he will take us away. That is one thought that people have because that will create space for something new. But again, a lot of scholars have dove into this word, takes away. They try to figure out, is this what he means? Is there something else maybe that there means? And to be honest, people are so divided on what this means. But the word takeaway uh, here in Greek is this word A-I-R-O, which is arrow, okay? A-I-R-O. And and what this word means, translated, it means take away or cast off, but it also actually means to lift up or to elevate, right? It means to to actually not just cut away, but actually to lift up off the ground and elevate something. So when we look at this, when we look at this, I want to focus on the second definition of elevate, to actually lift up. Because I was doing some research on vine dressers this week, right? Because again, I didn't even know what a vine dresser was pretty much, right? So I'm trying to research this, figure out what a vine dresser is. And what a vine dresser is, is that the good fruit always comes from plants that are elevated, like, like, like vines that are on the ground rarely will produce good fruit. Vines that are elevated will always produce better fruit. And so there's this verse, John 6, verse 37 says this, and all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And so, so a lot of people, they go back to this verse, which is also in John, and they say, no, Jesus is not saying that he will, he will cast you away or he will take you away. What, he, what, he, what he's saying is that the Father will actually elevate you. It will actually lift you up off of the ground. And I think a lot of us, we look at our life and we're not actually producing fruit. We're actually, we look at our life and we see ourselves, we see our circumstance and we see the life that we wish we had and we're not living it. We, we see the job we have and the things that we're doing and we wish there was something more that God had for us. I think it's because a lot of us, we actually need to realize that, that we can't produce fruit when we're sitting in the dirt. When we're in the dust, some of us, we're so stuck in depression or we're so stuck in, our, in anxiety. We're so stuck in unforgiveness. We're so stuck in bitterness that we're actually not able to produce fruit because we're so stuck in, in the dust. We're stuck in the things that we wish weren't about us. We're so angry all the time. The way we treat our family, we wish we didn't. And we're like, I wish I was producing better fruit. And I think for some of us, we need to realize that, that, that the Father wants to actually elevate you. He wants to take you up off the ground. He wants to dust you off and lift you up so you can start producing the fruit that he's called you to produce. To elevate you. To bring you up. How many of us were, were so stuck? We ha- we've had so many things happen and we can't forgive. We've been so hurt and we can't forgive and, and we can't forgive and we can't forgive and we can't forgive and we've been just so hurt. And I know that is so hard to walk through. Forgiveness is so challenging. I think it's so easy for us to accept Jesus' forgiveness, but it's so hard for us to give that. It's so hard for us to forgive other people. It's so hard for us to actually look at somebody and say, I forgive you for how much you've hurt me or I, for- I forgive you for all the things that you've done to me. Because when we're stuck in the dirt, we suffocate, right? We, we're not getting the nutrients we need because we're so focused on everything else. We're so focused on everybody else that we don't realize, we don't take a look within and realize, man, I need, I, I need some help. Because when we go through life alone, when we go through hard moments alone, that's where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death. And we just say, God, I can't do this anymore. And that's exactly the place we need to get to, to realize we can't produce fruit by ourselves. He says, he says later, he says, he says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, then you can do something. But if you don't, you can do nothing. You will be stuck in the dirt. You will be stuck in your pain. You will be stuck in your unforgiveness and your bitterness forever unless you would get attached to the vine. The true vine. That is what Jesus is saying right here in this moment. It's hard to bear fruit when we're living in the dust. It's hard to bear fruit when we're stuck in bitterness and unforgiveness and trauma and fear. It's hard to bear fruit when we're stuck in anger or stuck in addiction. When we're stuck in something. God, the, the, uh, God our Father, the vine dresser, comes to lift you out of that place because he's the only one who can do it. 
He's the only one who can actually lift you up. Because we try, right? We try as hard as we can. We try and get up earlier. We try, and, we try and fight harder. We try and make more money. We try and do all these things. And eventually, we're just striving for success. And when we strive, it'll leave us broken. Because we're striving. We're using all our energy to strive and strive and strive to be better, to do better. Rather than just taking a step back and saying, Jesus, I need you in this moment. Are you going to burn yourself out? You're going to burn yourself out. Only when we attach to him can we actually start to produce good fruit. You know, you, you may look at your life and feel that, right? You might feel stuck. Stuck in a job or stuck somewhere. Or you feel like, I just wish I could forgive more. I wish I wasn't so angry. I wish I wasn't so bitter. If all we're doing is wishing, we're never going to get there. It's like rubbing a lamp and hoping a genie comes so we can get our wishes. And then we get our wishes, everything's going to be okay. If you watched Aladdin, not everything was okay, right? It causes more problems when we wish. When we need to become, like we talked about a few weeks, we need to become more than conquerors. Con we can conquer fear. We can conquer anxiety. We can conquer depression. We can conquer unforgiveness. We can conquer bitterness. If we realize that we need to stop coping with it, we need to start conquering it. And this brings us some incredible things, right? The nation of Israel, if you read through the Old Testament, the nation of Israel oftentimes is referred to as the vine. And oftentimes when it's referred to as the vine, it, it's mostly to do um, with wrath and judgment. Right? So, so these people, they hear this, they hear, okay, he is the vine. That, that means something different to them than it means to us. Because they would have, they knew the scriptures, right? They had, they had known the Torah. They, they had known all these things and they had seen, okay, we're the vine, we're the vine. Wrath and judgment, that's what this means. We're wrath and judgment. And Jesus is saying, guess what? I'm the vine. What he's saying, he's saying, I'm going to take the wrath and judgment for you. He's saying, I'm going to do what you could never do for yourself. I'm going to give my life for you. I'm going to die for you because I am the true vine. I am going to take all that punishment. I'm going to take all that wrath. I'm going to take it on myself so that you can walk freely with the Father. So that you can walk in forgiveness. So that you can walk free. So that you can start to bear good fruit. That's what he is saying. He's saying, I am the solution to the problem. I am the solution. He's saying, I am the true vine. That's who I am. And without him, we can do nothing. He's essentially saying he's doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He's saying, you can't do it, but I can. You can't go through this moment by yourself, but I can do it with you. You can't stop being angry, but I can. You can't stop not forgiving, but I can help you do it. He's saying, I am the true vine and they they thought these israelites they thought just like we think we're failing we go through life and we're failing we we fail to be good parents we fail to be good siblings we fail to be good children we fail we fail we fail and we and they look at that and say yeah i can't do it and we look at our lives and i think a lot of us without speaking it we really really struggle because we feel like failures you know, that, that I think the, the older we get, I think sometimes the more we think this. Because we look at the life we've lived and we realize, man, I could have done something different. I wish I would have forgiven earlier. I wish I wouldn't have been so angry. I wish I wouldn't have worked so much. And we just feel like, man, I'm a failure. They felt like they could never be enough. And the reality is we're never going to be enough unless we attach ourselves to Jesus. He's the only thing that can bring us to the future. He's the only thing that can bring us the forgiveness that we're looking for. We can never live up to the standards of the Father. We can never live up to the standards of the vine dresser. And therefore, he had to come in your place. He had to become the true vine. And once we come into a relationship with Jesus, the beautiful thing is we get this beautiful promise. And it comes up in the next part of this verse. This beautiful, beautiful promise. It says this, I am the true vine. Verse 2 says this, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that he does bear fruit, he prunes. That's the promise. Like, how exciting is that? Once we come into a relationship with Jesus, he's going to cut things off of us that we wish he wouldn't cut off. Right? Like, like how many?
majority of us, when we come to, when we come to Jesus, there's some things that we wish that, that were still a part of our life that can't be anymore. And this is the problem. He says, I'm going to prune you. I'm going to start cutting things off of you. It's going to be painful. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun. But I'm going to do it because sometimes promises aren't always things that we wish we would have. You know, sometimes the promise that, 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 that Jesus has for us is, is not easy. I think sometimes we look at the promise, we think, man, woo, the promise, so exciting. I'm so excited. And Jesus is like, you can't take this with you. You can't take that relationship with you. You can't take this habit with you. We need to cut this off. You can't take this with you. That's the promise. And we look at that and we think, man, that's not freedom. Right? Like, that's not freedom. Free freedom's not me not being able to do what I want to do. Do you know what freedom is? Freedom is Jesus becoming the vine for you and for me. Freedom is us walking knowing, you know what? I know where I'm, I, I know who I serve. Freedom is realizing we serve a king. That's what freedom is. I think we've got confused what freedom means, right? We think freedom, and especially like those of us, you know, when we graduated high school, we were like, man, I'm free. But also, oftentimes our freedom led us to the worst decisions we ever made, right? Freedom from our parents led us to do things that we regret. You know, I, when I worked with student ministry all the time, my parents are giving me freedom finally. I finally have a phone. And then all of a sudden cyberbullying goes up and these kids are now depressed. And some of these kids we, you know, are looking at, we're looking at taking their own life because of their phone. Sometimes the freedom that we need, we don't realize we need. I think sometimes we look at this freedom and we think, man, like, like I want to do what I want to do. And Jesus is saying, man, I'm going to prune you. And when you do, I have something huge for you. Because prune, the first part of the definition of prune is this, uh, to trim a tree, shrub, or bush by cutting away dead or overgrown branches or stems. Right? That's the first part of the definition. We can expect pruning in our life. We can expect things in our lives that are holding us back to be taken away. It might mean letting go of friends or letting go of addictions or bad habits or anger or emotion or whatever it is. That might mean what it looks like for us. And then this is not easy, right? Oftentimes pruning causes pain. But some of us, I think all of us, we have things in our life that we need to finally let go of. Some of us, we've been Christians for so long and we've been bringing something with us over and over every week to church or to home. And we've been holding on to it. Like, I can't let go of this. This is the one thing. This is my, this is my friendship. I cannot let go of this friendship. This relationship, I can't let go of it. This gambling that I like to do, I can't let go of it. You know, pornography, I, I can't, I can't let go of that. I need it. I mean, every day we go through it and we say, okay, it's going to be okay. Because grace abounds. You know, I'll be forgiven. And yeah, you will. But if we don't let God prune us, the second half of this, this definition is this. Especially to increase fruitfulness and growth. Right? So he prunes you, not to cause you pain right but he prunes you so that you can start to do what he's called you to do he prunes you he, he cuts things off because he says i have something bigger for you i have something more for you this pain like like you're walking through i have so much more for you if we want to have better relationships we want to have better marriages we want to have better churches we need to realize being pruned as hard as that as it is, is exactly what we might need. If we want to be lifted up, we have to expect pruning. Pruning brings us to a deeper level of connection to the Father. For those of us who have kids, you know, disciplining kids, and my baby's one, is so hard. Because yesterday, what she likes to do, you parents, you've seen this, we feed her and she throws her food off the table. Every time. And I, so I look at her and say, no, you can't do that. But then she's so cute that I smile. And then she starts laughing. 
I'm like, this is not supposed to be funny. You're in trouble. <laughs> but discipline doesn't just hurt your kids. Sometimes it hurts you too. It's not, it's painful, but it's important. Jesus is saying, I have something so big for you, but you have to let me get close to you. You have to let me, you have to be vulnerable with me. Because pruning leaves us so vulnerable. Because what we're doing is we're saying, Jesus, I trust you. I trust you with my money. I trust you with my marriage. I trust you with my kids. I trust you. And some, some stuff has to be cut off so that we can become better parents. So that we can become better believers. So that we can become better people. Because our world needs good people. Our world needs Jesus. Our world needs you. Our world needs us to be the best version of ourselves, and that's going to be painful. It's not going to be easy to, to let go of something we've been doing for 30 years. It's not going to be easy to let go of friendships that we've had for our entire life, but sometimes we have to let go and say, God, I trust you. I trust you. Even though I don't see it, even though I don't feel it, I trust you. Even though I'm scared, I trust you. We have to let God move and lift us up out of our anxiety, out of our fear. Lift us up out of ourselves into the place we were created to be. You have to let go. Beautiful thing, you know, Jesus, the Father, doesn't just come in with his, like, pruners, shears. It's a better word. Shears, see, I'm telling you, gardening stuff. Come, he doesn't just come over with his shears and go, right? He comes in and says, hey, I'm here, and we're going through this together. And to be honest, he'll do it as fast or as slow as you let him. But I'm telling you, the faster we can let go, the faster we can move forward. The faster we can become better. We have to let God lift us up. You know, our, our dreams are often on the other side of a good pruning. Of things being cut off. We have to let God do it. You know, we, as this, we've gone through this series, we've done something called the takeaway every week and just to, something to remember, something to remember for this week. And this is what it says. The takeaway this week is the, the best that God has for us is often on the other side of a good pruning. Let go and let God lift you up into your destiny. Let go. Let go means trust. Right? I, again, my child, we, one, one thing I like to do, maybe this is bad, but what I like to do is I like to put her at the edge of, a, of our table. And I stand there and I'm like, trust me. She's one, right? And she just gets scared and then she walks towards me and she just falls off the table and I catch her. And I need you to realize that when we let go, God will catch you. God's not gonna let you fall. The Father's not gonna just like prune you and walk away. He's gonna be there to heal you too. You know, I wanna pray for us today, you know, for this. Because I think for me, this is like heavy, to be honest. And I look at my life and I'm like, man, there's a lot of things that need to be cut off. It's the truth. Like, we're, none of us are perfect. All of us have things in our life that we wish we didn't do or whatever it is. And, and I feel like this is just heavy for a lot of us. This is a hard place to find ourselves because, because I think we feel so broken and so much like failures. And we, we look at our life, we reflect and we think, man, I'm so broken. We feel as if we're stuck. And so I just want to pray for us today uh, for this. Father, I thank you for this moment we get to gather. Uh, Father, I thank you that today, God, I pray that you help us become vulnerable with you. God, I pray that today you help us when it comes to this whole area of being pruned, of cutting things off that shouldn't be there, of letting go of things and letting you move. And, and God, I pray that today you just help us right now even reflect in this moment. What are the things in our life we need to let you take away? 
What are the things in our lives that you need to take away? And what are the things that need to be cut off from us? What do we need to let go of in our lives? You know, real quick, be, before we close our service, you know, one thing we like to do every week is give an opportunity. For those of you maybe in this room who've never given your life to Jesus, we, we want to do that every week. We want to just give you an opportunity to say, you know what? Jesus, I give you my life. I give you all that I am. I give you the brokenness. I give you my fear. I give you my anger. I give you my unforgiveness. I give you my bitterness. Saying, God, I trust you. So there's a simple prayer that we can pray. and It's real simple. It's just this. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my life. I give you all that I am. And when we do this, you know, this is the start of a, of a relationship. You know, this is not all that you and him will need to talk about, but this is just the start of saying, you know what? God, today for the first time, I trust you. I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. And I just want to, everyone in this as place, just bow your heads, close your eyes just real quick. I just want to give an opportunity for people to respond. So maybe today, this is your prayer. Jesus, I give you my life for the first time. I just want you to get all the courage you have and just put up your hand so I can pray with you. So I can celebrate with you. Yeah, right there. Anyone else? Just put up your hand real quick. All the courage. If you're watching online, just write that in the chat, right? Jesus, I give you my life. You want to give your life to Jesus today. I want to, I want to pray for you. Anyone else? Just real quick, put up your hand. Beautiful, beautiful. Father, we thank you for our friends. God, we celebrate people giving you their life today. God, we, if we don't take this lightly, God, this is the best decision any of us could ever make. God, we celebrate. God, I pray that as they continue this journey with you, God, I pray that you uh, just meet them where they're at. I thank you that we don't have to come perfect. We just come as we are. And I thank you that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So good. You know, it was uh, July 4th this year. I spoke this message called 480 Days. I don't know if anyone was there for this message. And, and in this message, it was actually the first Sunday that we as a church were allowed to be open and celebrate without masks, no restriction. But it had been 480 days since the last time we were able to do that. 480 days. And you know, at the end of this message, I, as I was preparing for it, I felt God speak seven things to me. And this is for me, if you know me, this is not like, like this doesn't happen to me all the time. So when this happens, I really pay attention. Seven things that I believe God wanted to do in our church in the next 480 days. Now I'm going to read them for you just so you guys can have a refresher. Number one is that we will have to move to multiple services because we won't have enough space in our building to hold everyone. Number two is that we will have at least 10 small groups consisting of at least 10 people. So 100 people connected in small groups. That's what I believe. Number three is we will see relationships that took a huge toll during COVID find healing, including marriages, parents and children and friendships. Number four as we will see all of our ministry team serving on a three-week rotation so that people can get weeks off from serving. Something I felt God was speaking to me. Number five is we will be the go-to place in our community for people seeking help. People need food. People need groceries. People need prayer. They're going to find us. That's what I believe. Number six, we started to see some of this happen. Number six, we will have a vibrant children's ministry like we once had. You know, when I said this, we didn't even have our children's ministry running. Now it's running. You know, it's amazing. But this one right here. We will see at least 100 salvations and at least 50 baptisms. That's why I feel God speaking to me. That 100 people will find Jesus and 50 people will get baptized as a public declaration of that. You know, and again, since God spoke this, we've seen two people give their lives to Jesus. It's amazing. It's amazing. And today we're so excited. We're having a baptism. We're actually baptizing five people today. It's amazing. You know, and, and you know, our goal of what God spoke to me is 50 people. That's already 10%. It's already 10%. And we're only like a month in. I just want to encourage you that God is doing something in this place. We're seeing, and I, I, we can't take this lightly. We are seeing people give their lives to Jesus. That is the most beautiful thing in humanity. And then today we're seeing five people bat getting baptized. 
And I, I believe, I'm telling you, I believe this is just the start of what God's doing. And I say this to encourage you to say, you know what? God is doing something here. He is doing something here. And man, I'm telling you, COVID was tough, but the harvest is plentiful. God is going to do something new, something amazing, and something beautiful in this place because of Him. <laughs> he is so good. Um, so anyway, just real quick, if you still want to get baptized, we have space for you. If you want to get baptized, come chat with us. We'll walk you through what it means. And you guys can get baptized. We're getting baptized today at the Jackfish Lake at 1 o'clock is our baptism. Picnic starts at 12. Baptism is at 1. If you want to get baptized, come chat with me after the service. I'll walk you through what it means. That way we can just see God do even more. If you, if you are getting baptized, bring some people with you to picnic. You can celebrate what God is doing. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we love you.